Now, what about robotics? You did a lot of work in robotics when you were at NASA. Uh, we usually think of a robot as a humanoid thing with arms and legs and a head mm -hmm. that can sort of speak a little bit and uh, maybe he performs household tasks or, or does other useful stuff. Um, is that something that's becoming commercially practicable? So not quite yet. I, I think we're getting there. Uh, so there are a few uh, home robots you can buy. There's certainly a lot of robots in use in, in heavy industry. Uh, but for home robots, well, you can get one that will vacuum your, your floor. Uh, and some people find that useful. Some think of it more as a toy. I think you'll see more of those types of things. I think the robots won't necessarily be uh, humanoid shaped. Uh, that's mostly for the movies. Instead, uh, instead of having one general purpose robot that will do everything that a human does, mm -hmm. you'll have special purpose ones, uh, like the vacuum cleaner and so on. And so they'll be shaped for the task at hand. Now, another very interesting thing is voice recognition. Uh, the iPhone has the Siri software, which you talk to it, and it answers you. How hard is it to do that? And I mean, can you write a program that learns as it goes along? So the version you have on your phone can learn new words and new meanings while you use it? Or mm -hmm. is it limited by what it's programmed to do the day it was uh, created? No, so, so it's, it's certainly built on learning. And, uh, and all the modern uh, speech recognition programs are based on, almost entirely on learning. And then it's a question of uh, at what level do you learn at? And there's a lot of different things to learn. So, so it's learning uh, you know, the language in general, English as a whole, then it's learning your specific voice, then it's learning the vocabulary uh, that you may use that other people don't use, and then it's learning uh, your meanings of when you say this mm -hmm. word, uh, what do you mean? And so the learning's going on at, at all those levels. Uh, and then we gotta figure out uh, what do people wanna do when they're, when they're talking to their devices? How do they wanna uh, think about their devices and interact with them as, you know, is the device uh, uh, a slave or a buddy or are you giving it commands or are you having a conversation? I think we haven't quite worked that out yet. You know, we, had, we, uh, we went from computers to, from, uh, we started working with punch cards and feeding them in and then we got to be more interactive and then uh, we added a, a mouse and had a whole new set of uh, conventions for how we interact with computers. Well, there's been tremendous progress, but I'm wondering, um, in the course of creating artificial intelligence, does that necessarily give you greater insight into how natural intelligence works? Like mm -hmm. how does a human make a decision? How does a human organize his thoughts? How does he retrieve information from the memory, which is the piece he wants at that time? Mm -hmm. That's a great question, and I think it goes in both directions. So uh, artificial intelligence and computer science is both helping biology and psychology and is helped by it. Uh, and uh, you take insights in one field and you, you feed it into the other one. Uh, now, so, you know, I'm taking, I'm approaching it from the computer science point of view, so I just want to say I want to get my computers to do the right thing. Uh, in doing that, uh, I need to understand what's going on in psychology and biology uh, for two reasons. One is uh, humans and, and other animals are the best examples we have of, uh, of intelligent systems, and so understanding how they work is helpful, uh, gives me some inspirations to understand how the computers work. Now, the computer doesn't have to work exactly like a person. The computer is very different in terms of the amount of memory it has, the speed of its operations, and so on. But you get inspiration from understanding more about how people and other animals uh, do tasks, uh, like their vision system and so on. And then it feeds back the other way, in that uh, if we say, oh, well, this works in the computer, this doesn't, uh, can the biologist say, uh, does that make sense? Uh, you know, does that help me understand better uh, uh, how the human models work? What would you say is the toughest problem that needs to be solved in order to make artificial intelligence really useful? I guess uh, understanding how to interact with it. I, that I think we have uh, very good uh, uh, applications and models in, uh, in narrow domains. Uh, you know, so, you know, I mentioned some of at the start of the show, things like uh, detecting fraud and spam and so on. So our computers are very good at doing one task at a time. Uh, but people are, are in some ways the opposite of that. People are good at doing lots of different things. Uh, and uh, the, the range of what they can do is broader, uh, but their expertise is not quite as good, right? Mm -hmm. So if I ask you to 
multiply two hundred digit numbers, it's going to take you a long time to come up with the right answer. A computer can do it mm -hmm. in a flash. But if I uh, ask you to uh, look at a picture and say, uh, uh, where's the mountain, where's the people, where's the stream, mm -hmm. you're going to be really good at that, and the computer's not going to be as good. So it sounds like replicating vision is one of the most important things, having a camera look at an object and interpreting what that object is. Mm -hmm. I think that's right, and I, th I think it's a useful task. It connects you to the world, so we have a, a broader connection than just uh, typing at a keyboard. Now, if, if a computer can, can see, it can interact a lot more and, and be more natural. And it's also important in, in terms of learning because, uh, you know, we have been able to uh, teach our computers a lot by having them read text. There's a lot of text on the Internet, so you can, you can get a lot out of that and make a lot of connections and uh, know that this word goes with this other word and, and other words don't go together. Uh, but they're still just words. And you, re you really would like your computer to interact with the world and understand what it's like to live in the world. Uh, you can't quite have that, but uh, it seems like video is it, the closest thing. Well, I think Google has worked on this problem a lot, um, you know, trying to interpret words. Uh, basic search, uh, and you're an expert on search, doesn't know what a word means, but it can tell how frequently it occurs. Mm -hmm. But the next level of search would be, to have a better understanding of what the word means so it can figure out the nuances of what the person is asking for. That's right. So we, uh, you know, the first level is just, they ask for this word, show me the pages that have that word on it. The next level is to say, uh, uh, well, what did that word really mean? And maybe there's a page that talks about something, but it uses slightly different words that are synonyms or related words. Uh, and so we're able to do that to figure out which of the related words count and which ones don't. And then the next level is saying, uh, well, you asked me a string of words, uh, in, and uh, it's important what the relationships are between those words, and figuring out that, that out. And so we have to attack understanding language at all level and understanding the world at all level of what do these words actually refer to in the world. Now, Google is also getting pretty good at language translators. Mm -hmm. So, for example, there is uh, an app in which you specify what language you're inputting and what language you want to output, and it can be typed or it can be spoken. Now, do you have to have somebody who's an expert in all those languages in order to program that, or do you not even have to know the language in order uh, to do that? You know, that? we're able to do some of it without anybody on the team knowing the language. So I think, uh, I'm not exactly sure of the number now, but I think we're up to something like 64 different languages. And you can translate from any one of them to any other one. So that, that's over 4,000 translation pairs. And for some of those languages, we didn't have anybody who spoke the language. And what we do is we go out and find examples. And we just, we have an algorithm that our computer can learn from examples. And so the examples are, uh, you know, here's a text in English, here's one in French. And we know this document corresponds to this document because, uh, you know, a, of, of where we found them on the web. Somebody said that these are translations for each other. Or you could just feed it into dictionary, like if you want to get Urdu or something. Yeah, so you can use sources like dictionary, but we do most of our work uh, from translations that a, that a human has done. And so now we know if somebody asked me exactly for this page, I could spit back this page. But they're not going to ask me for exactly that page. They're going to ask me for some mm -hmm. subparts. And so we have to figure out uh, not only does this page correspond to this page, but this phrase here corresponds to this phrase. Now we have a, a dictionary, not just a dictionary of words, but a dictionary of phrases. And then the trick is to fit all those phrases together. And that's kind of like doing a jigsaw puzzle. You say, this fits here, where does this other one fit? And now they all go together. Yeah. So it sounds like the knowledge is always increasing. It's sort of like building blocks, putting blocks together. Mm -hmm. um, it's a little slow at first. Maybe it's a little bit awkward at first, but as time goes on, it gets better. That's right. Well, let me ask you a question about robotics. Um, this one of the advantages of robots is that robots can perform tasks in environments that humans can mm -hmm. uh, do it. For example, in space or under the sea. Yeah. So what does it take, say, to build a robot that explores the bottom of the ocean autonomously? It's not like it's a puppet and there's the guy on the ship uh, telling it exactly what to do. It just goes out and and gathers information, returns when it's ready, and then you download whatever it got. That's right. And, uh, you know, so I did my robotics work at NASA, and, uh, and we have robots, say, on, on Mars precisely for that reason, because mm -hmm. it is a hostile environment. 
and more so than that uh, because we don't have to bring them back. Mm -hmm. uh, because if you send humans, then you, you really want to bring them back, and, uh, and that's very expensive because then you have to bring all the fuel to be able to launch a rocket again. But a robot, you don't need to uh, mm -hmm. relaunch it back. You just land it and you're done. They're expendable. They're expendable. Uh, and, uh, and mostly we've had a, a mixture of autonomous operation and teleoperated operation. So you want the robot to have some capability to do things on its own, uh, mainly because uh, uh, you can't uh, be in communication with it all the time. If it's on Mars, just the uh, speed of light limits the, uh, the communication, and uh, the planet is uh, rotating, so sometimes you can't send a signal there. So you want it to be able to do some things on its own, but it can check in uh, once or twice a day and, uh, and take mm -hmm. commands. Uh, under the sea, Similar kind of thing. You don't have a, a speed of light constraint, uh, but you're gonna if you're always transmitting, you're gonna run out of battery power, and sometimes you're too deep down and you you can't transmit. So it's got to be able to to operate on its own and then come pop back up and uh, maybe get some more instructions.